Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, as ever, to the front pages of the newspapers, not all of them looking entirely familiar. There is the new Observer, and they've got an interview with Theresa May saying that she's going to fine greedy bosses who betray their workers by failing to pay into their pension pots. Uh, the Sunday Times, there is a story about Momentum Corbyn allies' plot to oust 50 Labour MPs. Again, we'll be talking much more about that. The Sunday Telegraph, we should welcome Trump visit, says Boris. There's a lot of Boris all over the papers today, I wonder why. Sunday Express, the Brexit enforcers. A hundred Tory MPs are going to are vowing to help keep Theresa May on the straight and narrow when it comes to Brexit, they say. Jacob Rees-Mogg, no surprise that he's involved at all. And finally, the Mail on Sunday. Top Tories in Chinese cash for Brexit, furore. But is it really a furore, or is this a sting that didn't sting? We'll talk more about that as well. Uh, Catherine, let's start by talking about the, the Observer's exclusive with Theresa May. Um, they've got there to write a piece, and it's quite a substantial piece. It's a really strong piece, yes, uh, saying that boardroom excesses can no longer be tolerated, the economy has to work for all. And there's a quote here, too often we've seen top executives reaping big bonuses for recklessly putting short-term profit ahead of long-term success. So it's strong language. Um, we've obviously heard Theresa May talk about this before, uh, on the steps of number 10 most famously, but I think this language is really strong. I guess the question is whether we'll an see anything actually happen. Because I think course, the public as mood... Ever. Yes. As ever, the public mood has shifted very dramatically in the last couple of years mm. um, against turbocharged capitalism, against high executive pay, um, and something needs to be done. The question is whether this will be enough. This will be enough. I'm glad I... she wrote it for The Observer, though. She obviously knows how to get impact for stories. Now, I did say The Observer was looking different. Like The Guardian this yes. week, it's changed rather dramatically. And, of course, when you relaunch a paper, you're also taking something away from readers. So you have to <laughs> ensure that they recognise that the paper has changed. And you've called these tabloids, not compacts. Why? Well, they're just smaller papers, um, so I don't mind what pe people call them, really, as long as they uh, find the good, strong Guardian and Observer journalism they're used to, uh, just in this really lovely new format. And, in fact, it was a great opportunity to think about what's the role of print in people's lives. The Guardian's got 150 million readers around the world, uh, but so when they're all digital. So the people who want to buy print, what is it they want from us? And I think they want something tangible and um, physical to keep hold of. But there is a real problem. I'll talk about this with Tina Brown later on as well, which is that simply people are buying less print. And therefore, you have to find an alternative way of earning your bread, yeah. earning your lunch. Uh, the, the Times has its subscription model, which seems to be working quite well. But you've got a very different model. So our model is more of a sort of voluntary paywall rather than a compulsory paywall. We still have lots of subscriptions and they do um, well for The Guardian as well, both digital and um, in print. But yes, our new model um, is, it's for the last 18 months, has been a really successful model. I think people were very surprised because it's based on membership to support the journalism. You don't get anything back. You don't get many sort of freebies or uh, anything like that. But what you do is you support Guardian Journalism. And you and feel better for that. You, you feel warm inside. Yeah, and you, feel, and you feel that you're keeping... Lots of people say to us that one of the reasons they want to give us money is that it helps keep the Guardian Journalism available to everyone. And obviously that only works for organisations like The Guardian. You need a strong mission. Uh, mm. You need perhaps something very distinctive, which The Guardian is the world's biggest progressive news organisation certainly is um, and you also need I think a close relationship with your readers um, and we've got all of those things so it's, it's working quite well so far we've got more than 800,000 um, people who give us money at the moment. James Cleverley, Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party, perhaps not a glaring surprise that you've chosen the <laughs> Sunday Times splash about momentum <coughs> tightening its grip. Let's just talk a little bit first about the story and then we'll talk about its origins. And so yeah on. sure well uh, what we have here is what we've seen happening subtly at the national level, which is uh, momentum really uh, tightening its grip on the Labour Party. We saw the NEC elections where they've they certainly it really well consolidating. There, yes. yeah. um, and what we're seeing here now is this uh, playing out at local government level, which is going to be the first time that we see the kind of momentum ideas really put into practice. And we have a story here uh, about uh, momentum gets its clutches on the first uh, council. We've got the London local uh, government elections coming up later on this year in the spring. Uh, okay. And we've got uh, some indications yeah. of, the, of the kind of policies, including uh, cutting the salaries of public employees who are earning over £60,000 sure. a year. Um, on the front page, they've said Corbyn allies are going to 
oust 50 Labour MPs, which sounds very dramatic. When you look at it, it's based on a single, unattributable, anonymous quote. Mm. And Momentum have put out a story saying this is a, just a, a tissue of nonsense. It's, it's very, very thin. And certainly, I was hoping to read who the 50 Labour MPs are. I was hoping to read who in Momentum was doing this. I was hoping to read a little bit more about it. And I can't find any of that in the paper. Indeed. And we might come on to why that's probably not the not the strongest story for a front page splash on a national newspaper in, in a minute that, later right. on. Yeah, yeah. OK, well, let, let's keep moving ahead. Um, because there is quite a tough story, uh, again for the Conservatives, inside the Sunday Times. This is Michael Gove and others, I would say, on manoeuvres, Kath. Is that a fair phrase? <laughs> well, it's, it's this, uh, these amazing quotes from Nick Bowles, who's um, a former housing minister, um, still a, a Tory MP. He said, he described, we have a government full of boiled rabbits. <laughs> Uh, which is apparently an Orwellian phrase, um, a George Orwell phrase, saying uh, that he thinks that the uh, governments full of people are either wet, uh, i.e. Okay. meaning soft, or um, they are not brave enough to be radical and that uh, it's a sort of timid government. Because he's so vivid, I'm going to read the whole quote, yeah. or most of it. We have a government full of boiled rabbits. Theresa May needs to give ministers their head and she needs to tell them to follow their convictions. And ideally, she needs to have a few convictions herself. Ouch! What do you make of that, James Cleverley? Well, unsurprisingly, I don't agree with Nick. <laughs> What's going um, on? I don't know. I don't know where this is uh, where this has come from. We've just uh, um, Catherine's just said in the uh, Observer uh, the Prime Minister set out her views about corporate responsibility and, and big business, which were uh, a, 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 a reflection of the things that she was saying on the steps of Downing Street, where she set out her vision. She, and unlike she's Kath, made it very you would clear. expect there are going to be really strong actions to follow these warm words. Well, I think that uh, the fact that she has, has made such a powerful statement in uh, The Observer indicates that we are very much focused on getting a grip of this kind of stuff. People expect that. But the point that I was making is this is not new. This, mm. is, not, this is not a response to things that have happened. This is her, this is her, her long-standing position on these you, issues. You've been a big Boris supporter in the past. We see Boris all over the front page of the Sunday Telegraph. And again in this story, it's said that Boris Johnson is going to win a great big cabinet battle to put more money into the NHS after Brexit. Is he on manoeuvres? <laughs> <laughs> Not as far as I know. Silly question. I know. Not as far as I know. All right. So as thin as the momentum story, perhaps you think? Quite possibly. Yeah. Let's move on to something that's definitely not thin because it's in his own words. John McDonnell, Shadow Chancellor, talking in the Sunday Mirror about his plans for the NHS and an emergency budget. Yes. Yeah, so this, uh, the, um, John McDonnell says that if he were Chancellor at the moment, he would unveil an emergency budget next week for the NHS providing um, £5 billion uh, input, and he'd, he'd do this by taxing um, higher earners more. Um, and this is, um, this is stuff we know up to a point already in terms of the high rates of tax, but he's bringing it forward. He's saying uh, it's, about it's about momentum in a different sense, I suppose. <laughs> Early days of a Labour government, this is the first thing we do, an emergency budget, more money for the NHS. And Labour clearly think, James, that there is a mood out there for people to pay a little bit more tax to, as it were, save the NHS. This is a, another watershed moment, if you like, in politics. Well, it depends. Um, if, if the Labour Party were honest enough to say we're going to pump extra spending into the NHS and you are going to pay more tax, I'd probably have a little bit more respect. But once again, what we're seeing is the Labour Party saying they're going to no. pump money in and someone o else... O over 80,000 you pay more, but, quite a few of those. But the point being is the vast majority of British people in reality will be paying more tax under Labour's plans, and come on to that in a minute. But um, what they keep doing is they keep saying, we'll spend mm. all this extra money, but don't worry, someone else will foot the bill. And that's just... I think, fundamentally dishonest uh, position mm. to, to hold with the British people. Now, The Telegraph has a story in which the Centre for Policy Studies, which is a right-of-centre think tank, yeah. we should say, yeah. has costed some Labour spending plans when it comes to renationalisation. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Um, and the figure they've put on it, uh, which um, uh, they've calculated it, £176 billion pounds to renationalise uh, these public utilities and, and, and the rail companies. And to put that into perspective, that is, that is about the same size as the NHS budget and the defence budget put together. If um, it's true. Well, if, uh, even if the figure's slightly off, e e you know, we're not looking at an order of magnitude error. You're looking at something at or near, you know, 100, 150 billion. And that is a massive amount of money. Yeah. And of course, once again, someone's going to have to pay. And they've calculated well, that Well, we'll certainly be talking to John McDonnell about that later on. Can yeah. I ask a little bit more about the story I described as the sting that maybe didn't sting yeah. quite strongly enough. It's on the front page of the Mail on Sunday, and then it's inside 
uh, the Mail on Sunday. And there are some suggestions the Sunday Times had it too. They were working with Channel 4's dispatches programme and they did a classic sting operation. They set up a little office in Mayfair and they had a Chinese lady who brought in three leading Conservatives and she tried to persuade them to do something improper. And sadly for everybody, they didn't. <laughs> well, this is, uh, <laughs> this is the point I was making about uh, those seeming gaps uh, in, in, in the Times. The Mail on Sunday has gone uh, what is still a big splash. But when you actually look at the language, it's, it's, all, it's all about what was done to the MPs uh, and the MPs peers, said. not what they've actually said. And it seems to be, as far as I can make out, and I've read through this, through this in quite a bit of detail, okay. that they were approached and they all said, that's very, very interesting. I'll, consult, I'll consult the parliamentary authorities and get back to you, which, which is, is exactly what they were not <laughs> supposed to do. They were supposed to say, yeah, yeah, give it yeah. to me. Yeah. So a bit of a bit of a non-story, big splash on a bit of a non-story. Catherine, as, as a newspaper editor, nothing worse than having a really big story that you're getting excited about, you're preparing your you know, emptying space across the paper for and it's not quite ready on the day. Well, especially if people know about it, which is what happened in this case. I think it's best if you try and keep these incredibly secret so that uh, yeah. no one knows about it when you fail yes. to deliver. Your next story is, we go a little bit further afield, but there's yeah. still a British connection to the, the talks in Germany between Angela Merkel and the Social Democrats. Yeah. And it's a crunch day today because there's a vote among the Social Democrats about whether their um, leader, um, whether they should go into a grand coalition with Merkel's Conservatives. And I think it's um, particularly interesting because, according to this terrific piece in The Observer, um, that the people who are most opposing the idea of a, um, an, an alliance with, a, with Merkel are the young activists in the Social Democrats. Mm. They say um, they, they want a chance for the um, SPD to renew itself. Um, they want to prevent the, the far right, the AFD, from being the official opposition in the Bundestag. Um, and so they may prevent this from happening. And again, the idea that it's the youth wing um, causing all the um, okay. excitement, I think, is very interesting. And that's really, parallel no, it's, to it's, here. It's, it's, it's and the, really... the vote's today fascinating story yeah. we were watching very closely now a few days ago James I noticed that Nigel Farage said something quite odd he said that we <laughs> Brexiteers he said are losing the argument things are going backwards something's gonna to have to change and he wondered what's he up to the Sunday Times thinks it knows what he's up to apparently uh, he seems to feel that not being the leader of a political party is uh, is, is is something he's unhappy with as a status um, and uh, he, there is now talk about him launching a new political party uh, which I think is uh, which I think is is interesting and obviously the you know the divisions within within UKIP and their internal arguments are, are, are boiling up here and uh, do we and both think that Henry Bolton can survive as leader of UKIP I'm not sure it's that relevant to be honest with you. I think this is the challenge that UKIP have got now is that they are just Mm. no longer relevant. I mean, what is the question to which UKIP is the, is the right answer? I certainly don't know. A long pause there. Thank you both <laughs> very much. That was a really good counter. Indeed, a gallop through the newspaper stories. Thanks very much. Uh, time to take a look at what's leading the Sunday papers. Um, let's start with The Observer. Uh, Theresa May writes there. She says she wants to impose fines on greedy company bosses who line their own pockets while failing to protect their workers' pensions. Here's the Mail on Sunday. It leads with claims that three former cabinet members were secretly recorded telling Chinese tycoons how they could profit from Brexit. They deny the allegations. The Sunday Express reports that more than 100 Tory MPs, led by Jacob Rees-Mogg, plan to pressure the Prime Minister to make a clean break with Europe in March 2019. The Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson, insists Britain must be welcoming to Donald Trump. Uh, that's the story in the Sunday Telegraph. Sunday Times says that left-wing allies of Jeremy Corbyn have drawn up a hit list of up to 50 Labour MPs. They want to be deselected before the next election. Uh, well, joining me to discuss all of that, the political leader writer for the Financial Times, Seb Payne, Victims Commissioner, Baroness Newlove, and the editor of The Observer, John Mulholland. A very good morning to all of you. Um, and let's start, shall we, with um, uh, the story in the Sunday Times about the Momentum secret hit list. The story itself strikes me as not necessarily being the, the strongest momentum story that we, we've ever seen, but 
We have seen lists of this type in the past, haven't we? Yes, and when you read this headline, you feel like we've actually all seen this before. And the key background to this is there were some changes within the Labour Party this week. The National Executive Committee, which is the all-powerful body that controls Labour, has now been taken over by Jeremy Corbyn's acolytes. They now have power over that body. And everyone's saying they're going to use this to further control the party and push people out who are not really on board with the Corbyn agenda. And this whole talk of deselection is about that. And the names that are mentioned in this story are the kind of people you'd imagine that Mark Bentham and Corbyn would want to get rid of. Chris Leslie, Hilary Benn, Angela Eagle, Maria Eagle. Um, they're all people who are not really on board with the Corbyn project. I don't necessarily buy into this story, number one, because at the end, Momentum says we are not campaigning for the deselection of any sitting MP. Sitting is the key word right, there. Right, also are is the, in the present tense. It doesn't rule it out in the future. Indeed, and I just think that if you were going to do this and try and remo the Labour Party into the Corbyn Party, you do it gently with a couple of particular deselections. Don't go for 50 MPs, because those 50 MPs will just break off and form a new party and then split the left-wing vote at the next election. But there will be more talk that it's not the last we've seen, but it's not quite the substance there yet to say it's actually going to happen. I mean, Helen, they have, if they have secured the opportunity to, to put their candidates in the right places, I mean, the, the line that always comes from momentum is, what well, we've done it through the democratic processes that exist within the Labour Party. And actually, turnout for the elections to the NEC was, what, 18 19%, which is where it generally is. I just think it, this headline doesn't help anybody about politics in general. And, um, you know, I don't come from a political background as such, from, from what I do, but uh, uh, somebody on the street, this doesn't look good, because when you select somebody and you elect somebody, you expect them to be sitting there. There's some other controlling power behind them. So I quite agree. It's the, the, the key word is sitting MP. So I'd like to see what happens further along the line in all of this. I mean, John, to... Momentum are clearly a force in, in British politics, but if you look at the opportunities that they've had to try and push for uh, greater control, they've not been desperately successful in getting their own candidates uh, put <laughs> forward, have they? No, but if you look at what's happening in some um, constituency Labour mm. parties, they have had um, they have had real power exercised in the last six months, and we know that the way that they've operated in places like Haringey, in Wavetree, in Liverpool, in Watford, has caused um, real unease amongst uh, moderate Labour activists in those areas, and I think Haringey is going to become something of a an issue for the Labour Party over the next year when Momentum may well take control of an 800 million an annual budget in the next couple of weeks and they may then move to cap uh, head teachers pay they may move to do a number of things which the right-wing press will use as a way to stain the Corbyn project more generally but but as an evil insidious force within the Labour Party I'm sure there are a few shouty idiots on, on Twitter, but where's the evidence for it? Well, Roy Hattersley, writing in The Observer only a few weeks ago, claimed that momentum is a real danger to the Labour Party because it is uh, actively organising from within an existing political party. Now, I don't agree with that headline, and I think Seb and Helen are right, is that there is no chance that sitting Labour MPs at that number will be deselected because you would, at a stroke, create a new centre-left yeah. Party in Britain. Um, I want to turn to, to, to the front of, as you reminded me, John, and you were right to remind me, uh, the first tabloid edition of the, of the Observer. And it's the, the story, Theresa May, and we've, we've heard stuff like this before, haven't we? Look, if there is a risk to, you know, if you place your pensions pot at risk, we will fine you. I mean, it's, I mean, it's a lift from the, Depart the uh, Work and Pensions Select Committee. I think what Theresa May is trying to do, writing in, in The Observer, is trying to recast um, that kind of meme that she arrived at number 10 with when she said she was going to govern for the many, not the few. And she made a very impressive speech <coughs> on the steps of number 10. Which was then kind of, to an extent, largely ignored for the she's remainder not, of that part. Yeah, I mean, she's not been able to deliver on that for reasons we, we know all too well, because uh, her premiership has been overshadowed by Brexit and she failed to get a mandate in last year's election. But what she's attempting to do is place um, those kinds of topics back on the political agenda about corporate governance, about a different and a better type of capitalism. And she's using the collapse of Carillion to try and re-engineer uh, and refocus some of what I think is a genuine uh, attempt on her part to try and recalibrate 
how British capitalism functions and functions better for ordinary workers and less good for um, corporate executives. I mean, it sounds awfully like, you know, the suggestion is that the Prime Minister is in agreement with John McDonnell, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, that this is a sea change moment, you know, for capitalism. I don't, I don't think that. I think it does relate back to her original speech at Downing Street. And, and to be fair to her, she's, you know, she's had to get into Brexit. Uh, she's damned if she does and she's damned if she doesn't. But this is about domestic policy and I think pensions is really important here. And I do think it's about time. We're hearing this too often um, about people's pensions and yet we're encouraging the younger people to have a pension. So I think she's quite right in making this stance. And um, I look forward to seeing what, how we go further on this. This is about protecting normal working-class people. I suppose that's the question, isn't it, Seb, is how much further this goes? Yes, because this kind of red Toryism idea, which is what Theresa May got into Downing Street on, it's talked about a lot within the Conservative Party. It never actually really comes to fruition. And the language here is the language of Jeremy Corbyn. You know, Theresa May has written in, in your paper, John, um, that she will govern not for a privileged few, but for every one of us. Mm. We've heard that somewhere before. Humming and the red flag as exactly. she was writing those words, no doubt. And then further down, she says, tough new rules will be taken to tackle executives who try to line their own pockets by putting workers' pensioners at risk. Again, mm. this is kind of the populist mood we're in now, but what is interesting in Mrs May's article, she also defends PFI and defends private involvement in public sector contracts. And I think this is the problem for the Conservatives. They're acknowledging Jeremy Corbyn is right by highlighting the excesses of capitalism, but their solutions are just amount to sort of diet coke Corbynism. <laughs> That's a good phrase, which I will be uh, stealing later today. Um, Helen, uh, the story in The Telegraph. Um, the decision not to seek judicial review of the, of the parole board's war boys decision to some people that have been legally educated, didn't seem that strange, in mm -hmm. fact. Yeah. However, the release of this man certainly does. It does, and I, I, you know, I was disappointed to know that the government are not going to go to a judicial review. But also, the fact that what saddens me is that the, the victims, the couple of victims that are going for judicial review, the cost to them having to crowdfund is also not very good, both politically. Uh, you know, Sadiq Khan said he's going to put his own one in, uh, but the operative word is he's looking to see if he can. And you know, and if the advice comes back, from the lawyers, that there's say, absolutely no So at the end of the success. day, I'm more concerned about the victims and about understanding. And actually, this is become quite uh, mixed. There's a victim contact scheme, there's some victims who weren't on the victim contact scheme. So I'm working with the government to ensure that it is, you know, a proper review. Uh, and, you know, we don't need the headlines to scare people. These victims are living on a daily basis, frightened about these decisions, that I don't know what the decisions are. And this is the whole point. It isn't transparent. You make a statement and the parole board make the decision. And after all, this is about the liberty of the offender, not the victim. And this is where the victim has to be with a capital V in bold to protect them. But, but, just in terms of the kind of the quasi-judicial function that the yes. parole board has, why should we have transparency over the way in which they arrive at a decision when we don't have the same level of transparency when it comes to the judiciary itself? Well, you, you know, judiciary and politicians argue between themselves, that, and I work with a lot of them on a daily basis. However, I have been working on this with the parole board before. We have judgments after an appeal court, and I've been asking why can't we have judgments? So, there's, you know, obviously we've got to have a balance here, and that's why I look forward to the review. But at the same time, we have to have a we have to know why they made that decision, because at the end of the day, the victims remember the judge directing that this this person wouldn't be released, and this is the cause of the whole issue once a victim remembers that and then finds along the line that they don't this is where it all starts to make them feel unsafe and their voices are not listened to again uh, well i'm afraid that time has rather gotten away from us we will have to leave it there john uh, helen seb lovely to see you thank you for popping in this Thank fine you. sunday morning <laughs>